Welcome once again to In Search of Christianity, brought to you by Bible Talk. As we are getting into the Sermon on the Mount, which is the definition of Christianity. Okay, so we're going to do that. Okay. But first, I just want to ask, Father, that you would just bless our time together. That your hand would guide all that takes place here. That you would watch over my mouth, put a guard over my mouth, Lord God, that I would not say anything that you don't desire. Lord, that you would open our ears, all of our ears, Lord, that we would just hear your voice. That you would open the eyes of our heart, that we would see wonderful things in your word, Lord God. Lord, use this time to train us in righteousness with your God-breathed word. We praise you and thank you in Jesus' name, Father. Amen. Amen. Well, in our last program, we ended up talking about this. We're talking about the Word, God's Word, mm -hmm. being for the saved. Yes. All right? First, that's what it said in, in 2 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, that all Scripture is God-breathed mm -hmm. and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, so that the man of God may be adequate, equipped for every good work. So for the saved, it's there to train us, to reprove us, to correct us, right? Mm -hmm. For the unsaved, God's word is there, as you said in the verse before, 2 Timothy 3, 16, the sacred writings which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. God has his word for the unsaved that they might come to that place. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, that they would hear that, that faith would be built up in their hearts, and they would accept that free gift of God the Father, Jesus Christ, His Son. Amen. Now, the, the problem is that if you get that confused, mm -hmm. that often leads to the people who are called to equip the saints for the work of service failing to be effective because they're trying to train the untrainable. Right. Right. Right? That makes sense. Yeah. You don't need to... You don't need to kind of call the saved to salvation and by the same token you can't train the unsaved okay they have to be they have to hear the good news of Jesus Christ to be drawn to him before we do this and as I say we're going to get into the Sermon on the Mount all right which is the most radical fanatical most beautiful most wonderful sermon ever mm. preached the problem is, if we're going to talk, if we're going to, we need to be able to communicate, all right? Many years ago, I, I started, Alice and I started a ministry with a couple of friends of ours. It was called the M.D. Solomon Institute. We started this out in California. Um, it was dedicated to my teaching biblical principles in the workplace. That's how it started, I, because I had had experience doing that kind of thing, you know, using God's Word or applying God's Word in the workplace. And so using the book of Proverbs as a training. I, absolutely. I was a national sales manager. When I was a pastor up in New York, I was also a national sales manager for a communications company in New York. And I did all of the training basically out of the book of Proverbs. And my goodness gracious, did God bless that time. Amen. So that led to when we came back from our work in the mission field in Central America, to starting this, this company, this ministry, mm -hmm. to train people. And it was specifically in the beginning to train them how to apply the Word of God in the workplace. Right. But it grew. It, 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 I was going to say evolved. It didn't evolve. It matured mm -hmm. into being seminars and conferences on personal and professional growth. Right. Okay? For the saved and the unsaved. Okay? So we've been blessed to present that material all over the United States. Mm -hmm. in, in foreign countries, I mean, I presented the material and I'm couple different, few different continents in a lot of different countries, even even at ships out at sea. That's right. Right? And it, it was basically 12 different seminar topics that, that comprised the entire conference. But one of the most, single most important topics that I covered, one of the most single most important seminars that I did, mm -hmm. was entitled The Tower of Babel, A Business Gone Bad. It was about the skills that are needed to be an effective communicator. And one of the principles is that you have to speak the same language. 
Now, I'm not just talking about, you know, if you're American, being able to speak French to talk to a French person or that type of thing. Because oftentimes, you know, even in English, we, we use different words, we use different expressions. And we're not, if you don't speak the same language, you're not going to communicate. Yeah. And, you know, in that seminar, I, I, I start with the premise of when God wanted to put an end to that Tower of Babel, that construction project, mm -hmm. he did so by destroying their ability to communicate with one another, yes. right? So, you have to speak the same language. One of the things that I have really noticed over the past few years, traveling all over, I mean, literally in the past few years, we've been on five continents and I don't know how many different countries. Mm -hmm. I've experienced a strange phenomenon. I, I may quote the word to someone only to have them say to me, well, that's not what the Bible says. Mm -hmm. And I look at them blankly. And usually after a brief investigation, what I find out is that that person is using a different Bible version or a different translation of the Bible that does indeed say something different, okay? Mm -hmm. So before we get into the Sermon on the Mount, I thought this would be a good place then to deal with an issue that may be very problematic for some people who are watching. Those who have translations that vary drastically from the ones that I am typically using and presenting in this study, okay? So I want to talk about the different types of Bibles, mm -hmm. right? And I'm going to, I, I, this is kind of a broad thing, but it's important because we need to understand that there are differences. So if I say something and you look at your, whatever scriptures or whatever Bible you're using, and it doesn't say quite the same thing, you need to understand this, okay? There are basically three types of Bible translations, okay? The first one I'll call formal. It's a, it's a formal equivalence is what it's known as. And uh, I, the verses that I quoted already are from the New American Standard Bible. Mm -hmm. And that is a formal equivalence or a literal or what's called a word-for-word -word translation. Now, others in that same genre are the, the King James, which is the most famous of all of the English translations, I guess, mm -hmm. along with the New King James, mm -hmm. the English Standard Version, and a few others, including uh, Young's Literal Translation, which works to try and be the most literal of, the, of them all. So while it can be demonstrated quite easily that as translators made the best efforts to transmit as exactly as possible what the Lord said, the formal versions are certainly not word for word. I mean, I can show you that, right? I believe, though, with the simplest of tools, like, you know, you got your Bible, a Strong's Concordance, uh, a, a dictionary, and prayer, mm -hmm. and the leading of the Holy Spirit. Most important. Yeah, not necessarily in that order, okay? A diligent believer will find that Scripture interprets Scripture. Mm -hmm. Jesus, after all, did say, but when He, the Spirit of truth, comes, He will guide you into all truth. So it's the Holy Spirit, ultimately, that has to be, in our lives, the one who, if there's something wrong with the, the version or the translation you're using, he'll kind of poke your spirit and mm -hmm. say, hey, look look more closely, or let's have a conversation about something, this. Yeah, there's something wrong with this. So that's the first one, as they say. And, and that's, I'm going to be perfectly honest, with you, that, that's what I believe, that if you're serious about the Word of God, that you should be using one of those formal, uh, translations. Li literal translations, yes. The next general one would be called dynamic, or known as dynamic equivalence, or thought-for-thought thought translations. And the most well-known of those would probably be the New International Version, the NIV. Uh, the New Living Translation, for example, the NLT, that's another one that's like that. So while those versions have become immensely popular, and indeed they are immensely popular, it should be noted that the process involved means understanding what God thought, and often replacing it, what man thinks God meant. So it will also involve changing the word and ignoring what God said when he said, my thoughts are not your thoughts, nor are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. Isaiah 55, 8. That's the great danger. You know, and it says in Proverbs 3, we're not to lean on our own understanding. The resulting translation will often subtly present man's thinking rather than the God-breathed scripture that is profitable for teaching, for your proof, as I was saying from 2 Timothy, right? The third type we're going to look at 
is functional, functional equivalent. And that, that's probably more commonly known, or you may recognize it as a paraphrase. Okay? Mm -hmm. That's a functional equivalent. In other words, they're saying, well, here, this is what it, this is, you know, not what it says, but this is basically what it means and what you'll understand better. This is what it should have said. <laughs> now, they do that, they say, to make it easier to understand. And certainly one of the most popular, here, at least here in, in the United States of America, is the message Bible or message thingy. And that's used by many pastors and teachers today, a lot. So what happens most often, I believe, is that the authors of these works wind up telling readers what they believe the Lord should have said instead of what he did say. You know, words have meaning. They actually become a trendy commentary on the scripture rather than scripture. And therein lies a great, great danger. Oftentimes, it seems as though the paraphrased versions make a mockery of the spiritual message. Mm -hmm. I, I just, okay, I want you to think about this. And again, I'm reading from the New American Standard right now, but it says in Jeremiah 8, verses 8 and 9, it says, how can you say we are wise and the law of the Lord is with us, but behold, the lying pen of the scribes has made it into a lie. The wise men are put to shame they are dismayed and caught. Behold, they have rejected the word of the Lord, and what kind of wisdom do they have? Okay. I want to look at, uh, just, uh, just to give you an idea, I want to give you an example of how that can affect our ability to understand each other. So as we, as we begin to go into the three chapters of Matthew that are the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7, I want you to first of all take a look at this, how that begins in Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 3, all right? Mm -hmm. In the New American Standard, here's what it says. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Got that? Got it. Now I'm going to read it to you from the King James Version, the authorized version. Mm -hmm. And seeing the multitudes, he went up into a mountain, and when he was set, his disciples came unto him, and he opened his mouth and taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Very much the same, right? Mm -hmm. And then, listen to this, when Jesus saw his ministry drawing huge crowds, he climbed a hillside. Those who were apprenticed to him, the committed, climbed with him. Arriving at a quiet place, he sat down and taught his climbing companions. This is what he said. You're blessed when you're at the end of your rope. With less of you, there's more of God and his rule. Mm. That's the message thingy. Now, the, the problem is, I mean, you, I pray that you see the difference in those. Oh my. And, and certainly the message, that's a, that, I can't say it's a translation. But it certainly doesn't say the same thing. So if I go out and I read those verses from the, the New American Standard or the English Standard Version or the New uh, King James or the King James to somebody, and they're reading this message, they look and they, they, all of a sudden I see this blank stare mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. because they're not reading the same thing at all. And then our ability to communicate with one another becomes very problematic, very, very problematic. You know, I first encountered that. I was visiting, Alice and I were out in California. Yeah. And we were visiting one of the largest megachurches in the United States. This is uh, quite a number of years ago. Mm -hmm. And as the sermon was being preached, they were putting things up on the jumbotrons all around the, this building. And I, I mentioned to Alice that a couple of the times when I saw something up on the, on the screen, it reminded me of a scripture. Mm -hmm. Until I realized that they were using the message and saying that was the scripture. Okay. You have to wonder, when the Lord speaks through the prophet Zechariah to say, And one shall say unto him, What are these wounds in thy hands? And he shall answer, Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. Zechariah 13, 6. 
That's the King James. Now, yes. are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay. What are those wounds in thine hands? Those with which I was wounded in the house of my friends. But then that becomes in the message, same passage. And if someone says, and so where did you get that black eye? They'll say, I ran into a door at my friend's house. Not the same at all. No, it's not the same at all. So, again, and the reason, I'm, the reason I'm bringing this up and talking about it is we are going to spend time, we're going to spend quite a bit of time over the coming, uh, who knows, maybe till the Lord comes back, going through the Sermon on the Mount, verse by verse, line by line, maybe at times word by word. Mm -hmm. And if you're reading something that is entirely different, the first question in your mind should be, why? Yes. Why is it entirely different? Yes. Okay. But I think that if you if you don't understand this quandary, this mm -hmm. Bible version quandary, I call it, going into this, it may really put a block yes. between us sharing the Word of God. Mm -hmm. okay. now, you, you, you don't have to have a doctorate in theology to know there was a difference between talking about the wounds in my hands and getting a black eye running into a door. Exactly. Yeah, you don't have to, okay? Now, I just want to suggest something, and if you have a piece of paper and a pencil, you might want to write this down, because one of the very, very best works that I know of on this topic of Bible versions and translations is called, it's a book called The Word of God in English, and it was written by a man named Leland Riken, R-Y-K-E-N. He's a professor, professor of English at Wheaton University, at Wheaton College, and that was published by Crossway's book. Crossways Books. I have trouble speaking English. It's a very serious book for very serious students of the Word. So I don't want to spend a lot of more time on that, but I, I do need you to know, in case you, if I'm, if I'm quoting scriptures to you and they're not making sense, you need to look at what translation, what version you're using, mm -hmm. and then ask yourself, why are you using that? I'm going to tell you, you don't have to go back very far before you find a time when, and it's, I, I understand, like the, the the King James is English that is typically 400 years old, but you know what? I saw little children learning and using it, okay? Don't be, don't us to underestimate the power of the Holy Spirit to communicate truth to you, okay? Right. Remember, all scripture is God breathed. That's theonoustos, and, and that's exactly what it says. I'll tell you, it, you know, in, in the New American Standard, it doesn't say God breathed, it says inspired by God. And I think it says something similar to that in the King James. Mm -hmm. The Greek words that are used there literally says God breathed. That's important, because you want to know something? That's where life begins, exactly. is with the breath of God. Go read Genesis. Mm -hmm. God formed Adam out of the dust of the earth, but he breathed life into him. His word is the breath of life. We're not to add or take away from God's word, period. That's, you can find that in Deuteronomy 4, 2. You can find it in Proverbs 36. You can find it in Revelations 22 and other places. Mm -hmm. God is very jealous over his word. And it wasn't a suggestion by him. It was no. a command. So we need not to be careless with God's word, which is holy and pure. Right. Okay? All right. So okay, we're straight on that. And if you have questions about it, write to Jesus at heaven.org. I mean, spend time talking to the Lord. Go do your own study. Compare these things and understand that, they're, that God's word is important. All right? Every word is important. All right. So now that we've covered that, I'm going to get into the, the beginning of the Sermon on the Mount. Do we need to do a drum roll? <laughs> We're going to start with the Beatitudes, okay? That's a, a good place to start. Yes. Starting at Matthew chapter 5, verse 3. <coughs> Let me first of all just read them, okay? Mm -hmm. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. 
Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people insult and persecute you and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Okay? okay. You with me? Yeah. Okay. And I, do, I just, this probably, maybe, I, I'm just saying, this is a good place for me to tell you. If you have questions or comments, or, you know, you suggestions, you want to communicate with us. One of the best ways you can do that is go to our Facebook page. Go to the BibleTalk.com website. There's a link there to the Facebook page. Um, we'd love to hear from you. And I'm, I'm trying to make this as much as possible a conversation with you. Okay. I've heard, and I say, Alice and I have been blessed. I mean, I've been doing this for about 40 years. We have been blessed that our ministry has taken us uh, all over the all over the United States of America, up into Canada, down all through Mexico, and into Central and South America, all over the Caribbean, in Africa, East and West Africa, all over in, in Europe. Okay, as a matter of fact, we're getting ready to go back overseas in just a couple of months. And I've heard so many preachers call these beatitudes "be happy" attitudes. And while that may sound very cute, I, however, strongly believe that these would much more accurately be described as behaviors and attitudes yes. of the righteous. That's right. So if you want be attitudes, it's behavior and attitude of the righteous. Mm -hmm. You see, I believe that there is a significant, but often subtle, spiritual difference between being happy, being blessed, and being filled with the joy of the Holy Spirit. Right. Now I know that the common use in the world may blur the lines between those things, but it's worth a look to try and understand the difference, all right? Mm -hmm. There was an Englishman um, who was known as the father of liberalism, okay? He was an English philosopher. His name was John Locke. He died in 1704. Let's put a time frame on this, right? He had been regarded as one of the most influential Enlightenment thinkers, and he had incredible influence on the American Revolution and on the founding fathers. Thomas Jefferson, for example, called Locke, along with Francis Bacon and Isaac Newton, the three greatest men that have ever lived, without any exception. Oh. Okay, words are important. Yes. Now, if those three Enlightenment thinkers are to one of, if not the most influential, important founders of the United States, where, I wonder, does that leave, in his mind, Jesus Christ. Amen. Remember, we started talking about this as about a matter of relevance. Yeah. Yeah. And it would appear that while you know he, he thought Jesus was a good moral teacher, he wasn't really relevant to the, to the life of him. Right? So Locke wrote in, 18, in 1689, and I'm, this is a direct quote, Civil interest I call life, liberty, health, and indolence of body, and the possession of outward things. And in, in 1693 he wrote, the highest perfection of intellectual nature lies in a careful and constant pursuit of true and solid happiness. Mm -hmm. Now, Thomas Jefferson, along with Franklin, John Adams, Robert Livingston, and Robert Sherman, would immortalize those thoughts in the writing of the American Constitution in 1776. Pursuit of happiness. Okay? Because that's what it says in the Declaration of Independence. We hold these truths to be self-evident that all men are created equal, they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, mm -hmm. that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. I want to say happiness is a circumstance. Yes. Blessed is a condition. Mm. Right? We talk about happy nice. birthday, that's, a, that's right, a circumstance. Right. Happy hour. <laughs> <clears throat> Those are flitting and momentary circumstances. The constitutional idea of happiness is a self-focused celebration of the human potential, apart from the saving grace of Jesus Christ. 
The Lord, who was absent in Jefferson's list of the greatest men, is then considered, while a good teacher on morals, to be otherwise irrelevant. Hmm. The word of God promises blessings to those who has commanded pursue righteousness, love, and peace. That's what it says in the word. We're to pursue righteousness, love, and peace, not happiness. The word happy, I'm a word guy, the word happy comes from, from hap, chance or fortune, like, like haphazard, all right? right? The sense of very glad that was recorded in the 14th century. And it, that has its root in wealth and riches, okay? Mm -hmm. Blessed, on the other hand, and this is interesting. Oh, my brother and sister, mm -hmm. listen to this. Blessed comes from a word that means to consecrate, to make holy. Yes. Mm -hmm. And that has its root in a word that means to mark with blood. Wow. From the word blotham, which means blood. Mm -hmm. Originally, a, a blood sprinkling on pagan altars. This word was chosen in Old English Bibles to translate the Latin word. Benedictionary, okay, both of which have a ground or, or sense to speak well or to praise, but were used in scripture to translate the Hebrew word brah, bend to knee. bend the knee, to worship, to praise, to invoke blessings. Okay, the meaning sh shifted in late Old English to confer happiness, okay? So think about that. The word happy comes from luck. Blessed comes from the shedding of blood. Luck. It's a big difference. Boy. Joy comes from being a fruit of the Holy Spirit and from hearing the Word of God. That's what John the Baptist said when he was speaking of Jesus and he said, He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. So this joy of mine has been made full. John 3, 29, hearing God's word, hearing God's voice will bring that blessing mm. into your life. It'll bring the fullness of joy into your life. Obedience, hearing God's word and obeying God's word brings the fullness of blessing into your life. Read Deuteronomy 28 yes. in any version, I promise. Yes. Okay? So, so I said, I want, to, I want to make sure that we're clear on that before we start. And we're going to look at each one of the Beatitudes yeah. one by one. And we're going to look at them in depth. But you need to understand, they're not about trying to make you happy. They are trying to make you blessed. Mm -hmm. Okay? And they are there for God's instruction that you have that abundant, joy-filled life that he came to give you. And that you, living that life, would be a faithful witness to the promise of God the Father's love. So, Father, we thank you so much. Yes. That you loved us so much. Oh. That you sent your son Jesus Christ into the world to shed his blood for us. That the stain of sin in our lives would be washed away. That we would be washed clean and made right with you. Made righteous. Thank you, Jesus. So Father, we thank you for that great gift. Mm -hmm. For what Jesus did for us that we could never do for ourselves. Lord, we count ourselves blessed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Until next time. God bless you a lot and goodbye. Bye bye. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross, the emblem of suffering and shame. But I love that old cross. Where and best for a world of lost sinners